So yeah, this has been obviously a work in the making to get to this point for a little while because you're an extremely, extremely busy person with obviously Sea Sisters and things like that, which yeah. is really, really exciting. And I'm looking forward to like delving into that. But I think we should warm up by obviously saying that our history goes back around about 10 years or so. Yeah, back to Oxford. Back to Oxford in the first ever Jamie's Italian yeah. where I feel... The flagship. The flagship. I always have to say you that because everyone's like... No, what was that restaurant about? And I'm yeah. like, no, you, you don't understand. Like, when this it was... is another level <laughs> yeah. that you've never experienced. Yeah, because <laughs> it's quite crazy, because I do think back to that time, and like when I looked at Padella opening and stuff like that, it was like so many similar recipes yeah. and similar quality, and like yeah. I think the essence of what it was trying to create yeah. was like good quality, yeah. hearty food at a, at a price in which was accessible to yeah. people to be able to experience, Absolutely. and a bit of a cultural thing as well. Yeah. I think it just expanded to a point, and I'm sure like when you look at the major elements of it there was just like there was too many fire there was too many lost leaders basically yeah. i think you know they had amazing big sites and yeah, yeah, yeah. the restaurant industry completely and utterly changed yeah, um absolutely i was yeah that that was a bit of a grounding for me with you know italian food i didn't realize it at the time but um just sort of the the thorough training and like every day before service they would bring out a couple of dishes you know my mum was a, a, a she's a chef and a cook and has, has been for my whole life and uh, I've grown up with amazing food, but that was a introduction to sort of the restaurant world and having grown up with good food and then seeing it in a restaurant scene. I loved eating all of that food before service and like trying it all, but I never thought the big step was going to be becoming a chef and working in restaurants as a career. I was just getting stoned and <laughs> rolling into work, <laughs> trying some nice charm before service. And uh, it was great, yeah. but actually learning those recipes had such an important yeah. part of my career. And also I think learning the province of food, like, yeah, you know, yeah. understanding where different varieties of cheese have come from or, you know, like particular varieties of yeah. fruit vegetables or things like that. Yeah. And just like, I don't know, even learning about like balsamic vinegar and things like yeah. that, like, you know, the aging process and just the heritage yeah. that has gone behind all of that kind yeah. of stuff. And the, also the cultural reference to all of it yeah. as well. Um, and, and grating all of that Parmesan. <laughs> pre-service parmesan job bloody hell is it like <laughs> muscles popping out you didn't know you had that then that then led you on to quite a, quite a time in trulo yeah i mean i actually didn't plan on working in an italian restaurant i worked for morrow for like a month or two months shout out to sam clark um, he took me in and it just i was basically the sort of the last one in first one out because they had so many commies come in before me it was run up to Christmas. The menu there is delicious food. Uh, it's just, a, it's quite, it's like seven starters and you've got a tiny little section. <laughs> For me, I was like, I've got no idea what I'm doing. You know, I have so many jobs to do and there's already two commies before me that are trying to do the same. So basically Sam Clark, the legend, called up Tim from Trulo and said, I've got a really good guy here. He's got a good palate, he knows his food, but we just don't have the space and we need someone that's knows what they're doing it can like hold the fort a bit and tim called me up and was like hey mate um i'm a friend of sam's i've got a restaurant in highbury uh have you heard of trulo i was like no um he's like well it's italian food um why don't you just come in and have a trial i was like oh, i've done italian food man like, i worked at james italian i'm like and my mum used to love cooking moro you know ottolenghi that kind of stuff so that's what i wanted to do that's what i knew but i went in and it was the best decision i ever made trulo was one of the best places to work as a new chef, to train, to learn. Senior chefs, Connor, Tim, Adam. I learned so much from all of those guys. And we're so tight now because of it. And yeah, I owe them a lot and I love working there. It must be so lovely to have the support of some people like that that you can now lean upon now and things like that to ask questions, advice, guidance and Absolutely. everything like that. I actually called Connor the other day about um, Cuttlefish Inc. And we had a 20 minute conversation about braising cuttlefish <laughs> and just like different techniques. Cause yeah. you know, it's one thing doing 10 kilos of cuttlefish in a, in a restaurant yeah. and getting a gastro's worth in the oven to this where I'm doing 200 kilos mm. on my own and trying to figure out a way of doing it. And to call someone like Connor, who's we've been working in restaurants his whole life. Yeah, it's just great to be able to have those conversations. And Tim been really supportive with what, what I'm doing. Um, you know, they're all, they're, they're legends that mean a lot to me and I can, I can definitely uh, still learn a lot from them. 
And I think as well, like I remember it might have even been at the beginning of the pandemic, you and I had a conversation, I think, called up and it was very clear in the conversation you had like a real entrepreneurial spirit and you were like, I love food, but I, I, I want something maybe to call my own and everything like that. And I think, you know, it's now transpired that nearly towards the end of this pandemic period, you've like come upon yeah. Sea Sisters and things like that. So I, I'd love to know a little bit of like how the process and the transition from being a chef and understanding all of that kind of thing is now led you to the position of obviously starting Sea Sisters, which is England's first cannery, basically. Yeah. So um, we, I guess, landed on the idea a long time ago when we were traveling in a transit van through Europe, pre-kids, eating baguettes and tin fish and tomatoes from the market and, and not a lot else. And we were just loving how convenient it was, how beautiful the packaging was, how tasty it was. We loved the old time aesthetic and it's more than just food. It's like it's a product and everyone, it resonates with everyone. Everyone's had tin fish. We just thought oh, it'd be great just to be able to make a, a, a product like this and, and set up an actual cannery. And that was just a pipe dream back then. Just an idea. Const you know, when you're doing these, you're traveling around, you're like, right, we're going to move here. <laughs> we're going to buy a little, we're going to rent a house for six months. You know, you're in the middle of like Barolo or something. And then the other, another idea comes a week later. So that was like where it sort of the seed was planted, I guess. And then I, you know, had children. I was working in kitchens. It was mad. Didn't know at the time, but look back and think, how did I get through some of those periods? Patience was born prematurely, like six weeks premature back in, um, July 2019, middle of like a heat wave. And I was like cycling to work and then going to the hospital because she was in an incubator and then just like cracking on at work. And everyone's like asking me how patient she is. I'm like, yeah, it's just fine. But actually, when I look back, that's a crazy time where your daughter is like this little tiny pre, you know, totally not what she should look like uh, in a little incubator. Um, and I was just like cracking on. But Anyway, I digress. That was a, a crazy time. And then another child turned up and then I carried on working in kitchens and the pandemic hit. And it was like this amazing break where we just stopped going into the restaurant. And we had patients who was one and a half, Clover was three months, and we were at home and we could just be in the garden. And we cherished it every minute. We loved it, best time of our lives probably. And then um, pop back into work for a few months between the, the lockdowns. I didn't mind going back in so much because I was seeing people I hadn't seen for a long time and it's being part of that camaraderie again. And, and then um, I think Charlotte, it actually, it was the end of summer when she popped out into the garden. I was out with the girls and she just shouted, babe, babe, we've got to do this fucking canning idea. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, like my idea is just like, like my head's like racing. It's like, uh, okay, like, you know, from that point, I was just like thinking about it. Like, how do we approach this? How do we just start typing in like fish canning, England, like fish cannery, like London, like, no, obviously not. And just kept on digging and digging and sort of couldn't find anything. And then just like looking at how the Portuguese are doing it. And, and then the Americans are really into home canning. So you go down this sort of avenue canning at home and this you know they, they love a bit of home canning but they're also terrified of it at the same time there's so many regulations they're sort of feeding you all this information that is extremely primitive and like they're very careful which is fair enough you know that, that it is very dangerous because of like bacteria and yeah. stuff they can, yeah okay botulinum is postidium botulinum um it's the kind of number one terror when it comes to home canning basically a, a bacteria that can exist without air and moisture and thrives in that environment with no acidity. So all these low acid foods, you're canning your vegetables at home, like your asparagus, and you haven't done it properly, it's danger zone, yeah. So I was like, fuck this, <laughs> soldiers, really all this. I'm not doing fish, I'm not doing anything to do with canning. Uh, and then we'd like sort of have a break from reading up about it and I'd spend nights just sort of like falling down, going down rabbit holes and convincing myself it was going to be all right. And then reading something else and you're like, uh, so we had this like few months of sort of looking into how we might go about doing it 
And then we ended up just thinking, fuck it, let's just buy a piece of kit and, and trial it. So we managed to find this legend in Eastern Europe, uh, where they also do a lot of home canning, sorted us out with everything we needed, told me in very brief, broken English, like how I have to do it. It um, involves like applying over pressure and you've got to have the right amount for what you're putting in there and the product and how dense the product is in the can. We had to sort of read this Russian manual where this thing, piece of equipment was made with <laughs> Google Translate, just like hovering over it, trying to like figure out <laughs> what these guys were all about. Um, I love ridiculous. that. And then being completely terrified of this autoclave that we bought during the first, I literally got it going and just like got everyone out of the house. <laughs> it's like, this thing is a bomb <laughs> and I don't trust them. Was it autoclave? But, so autoclave is a sterilizing unit. Cool. So yeah, canneries use uh, autoclaves, also known as retorts, um, generally with steam. Yep. Um, and they'll penetrate the can to, to kill all the nasty bacteria. In it. So that's how it works. But we bought this vessel <laughs> from Russia and um, it was, a, it was a massive learning curve and we spent a long time just absolutely mullering cans of fish and being like, that is disgusting. <laughs> we're, like, how are we ever going to get to a point of enjoying this fish and just started like making something like overtly like strong in, in flavour. So try and mask the flavour of the, the can that we were like making. Anyway, I'm going into like lots of detail here, but it was, um, you can picture a tiny very tiny kitchen with two kids running around like naked and me trying to like test lots of cans of fish and just like guts and the beard and like and loads of pieces of paper and, and paper like and, yeah like, just yeah, everything just, just like, like, trying to like is this can one like, or can four yeah it's, you know, <laughs> just like yeah combining lockdown life with um, a fish cannery <laughs> and like new newborn kids it was um it was a really interesting fun uh time and we sort of landed eventually a year later on some recipes that we were happy with but we knew that this is as far as we can get them in terms of quality so we started researching into working with expert thermal processors and then we got these legends on board who took our products to the next level basically we got them as far as we could. We were happy with, you know, the oils that I was making, uh, the marinades, and then we put them through some serious kit that became a, a product that we were really proud of. Charlotte shed tears the first time she tried the fish that came out of their machine. And it was an exciting moment. That was like a real turning point for our, for our business. It was like, fuck, we have got something here that we can actually shout about and tell people about. Now we just need a brand name. Let's start building the brand. We can we can do this. Like this is a thing. So we spent the next few months building that brand, using them, trialing more recipes, and then um, things just like swiftly escalated towards Christmas, where we were like trying to get some cans out for for Christmas so people can try them and get feedback. Basically, it's amazing. I think for anyone to actually understand the or journey that like the journey but also the tenacity that's required like I think everyone always looks at something and they're like it's momentary and it's like this has just been created but mm. you're describing a whole year of graft not even to yeah. be able to give a product to sell to someone at this yeah, moment yeah. and I think it's really really fascinating to hear that whole yeah, thing yeah absolutely yeah that, 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 I do kind of uh, forget that you really were able to spend that moment and celebrate and be like, right, there is actually something yeah. here. Now let's actually take it, like, like be able to take it to the people, yeah. really. Yeah, so after that day, we um, we had childcare. We were driving back. Just like, we've got to go out and celebrate this moment. This is a big t moment for us. We've had this whole year of trialing this, these recipes and suddenly we've got something that not only mimics like what you might buy, it's like a high-end sort of tin fish, but competes in terms of flavor and quality so we were just like we've got to go out so we just went out had a banging meal with some in some local pub and yeah it was a, a great night and uh well deserved yeah from that from that day yeah, we just focused on the brand um sat around thinking of names and we landed on sea sisters pure you know it was uh inspired from our daughters by our daughters they were like, running around the whole time whilst we were doing it uh we feel 
they've got such a strong connection with each other and you know, sisterhood is such a, an amazing thing. And we wanted to try and create a bit of a legacy for them. And I guess we wanted them to be a big part of it. And they are our story, you know, they're something me and Charlotte have already created together. And it's just like, just all seem to harmonize really and just make sense like from the yeah. branding from like them being part of the process i think also like what you're saying is really beautiful about leaving a legacy as well and then being part of it yeah. it's really really stunning yeah. I, I hope they thank me when <laughs> when they're older uh, dad our clothes smell of fish yeah, exactly. <laughs> Relax. Thanks, no choice but to enter the fish industry me and my partner have a company called um ink fish bar you know, you're referring to like cuttlefish and stuff like that, which I find really fascinating because we've been using a lot of squid and like one of the things was actually to use cuttlefish because obviously it's a lot more native to the waters yeah. of the UK and actually it's more in abundance and things yeah. like that. So touching on sustainability and stuff like yeah, that, yeah. but it's a process in which you need to give it a lot of love and care to be able yeah, to get yeah, the best yeah. out of it. Absolutely, yeah. And I think as well, like, you know, understanding the fish industry a little bit, I think it might shock people to understand that if you don't have day boats and boats that have gone out to sea, maybe into deeper waters and trawled or whatever, they can be out in the ocean for maybe five, six days and they've caught fish on day one. You then have a situation when it's coming into your supermarkets, coming into even your fishmongers, sometimes depending on that kind of quality. And before you then eat it and you might then have it in your home for four days or so, you could be talking that the fish has been in your fridge or been, alive or been dead for nearly up to 15 days. And I think... A lot of people don't understand that. So um, this is where canning comes in amazing, that you're using day yeah. boats and um, you've got some great suppliers in which you're working with and stuff like that yeah. for that. Yeah, I mean, that is a big focus for us and having no waste and uh, working with the seasons, selecting fish that is in our waters in abundance at that time that we harvest it. Uh, it's very important. Uh, cuttlefish is currently in season. We get... Um, beautiful potted cuttlefish which is yeah. caught in a similar method to say lobster and crab so yeah it, it's a very sustainable option and um, we want to look at using cuts of meat that don't often get used um, or can so there is a focus on on minimal waste start using the cheeks of the monkfish uh, amazing piece of meat that often sadly will get chucked overboard once the fisherman's taking the you know the, the tail off purely because he doesn't have the manpower or time to do it it's not because he wants to do that he would love to be able to have the time to dig all those yeah those cheeks out but we already given that option and demand uh, as well right if no yeah. one's actually buying it at market exactly. then there's no reason for them yeah, to yeah. put the energy into actually yeah. making that happen yeah. so we want to try and uh, make that an option for them in terms of canning there's a lot of fish that we would love to use but just isn't suitable like Megram sole is a, a fish that needs to be consumed more. It's such a beautiful fish and it's plentiful, but um, we don't consume it enough. And we export so much fish. And we, just, we want to try and encourage people to consume and consume British fish and help sustain the fishing industry. And I'm learning a lot from people like Pesky, uh, Jace at World Harbour. He gives me lots of snippets of information every time I speak to him on the phone. It's just like people on the front line that I'm learning off. But they, they've they got a long, yeah, it's a long, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff happening, but it's also a long way to go in terms of creating a sustainable fishing industry in the UK. Um, but we want to be part of that sustainable fishing industry and we're going to help as much as we can to, to push it. And to amplify it's, that voice of it yeah, as well. Yeah, because we are great. learning, I'm learning as much as, the, you know, Joe Bloggs down the road because there's so much to know and, um, yeah, I want to help as much as I learn, help pass that information on yeah. with our brand. Um, and that's really important for us. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think the thing is with everything, the more that I delve into this kind of world, the more I realize that change is happening extremely quickly and there's a lot of learning to be done very, very quickly. And it's going from a point of, you know, areas of government and then it's like being translated as quickly as possible to the to the frontline people yeah. and it's it's got to be, it's yeah. got to happen really quickly so yeah, yeah. they are essentially going to make the decisions how in what in which direction the fishing industry goes and you know in terms of like plastics in the ocean and talking like not just plastic bottles but like fishing gear net size it's a place a massive that's the majority of the plastic in the ocean is from gear 
there are there needs to be kind of rules and regulations placed around that, you know to do with that and what can be used and and cleaning procedures put in place i suppose so like talk to us a little bit about your product range and stuff like that at this moment in time very good point charlotte's brought some back uh so we currently have the initial lineup still that we, we launched with um we have beautiful mussels from foy it's a beautiful organic mussel farm um offshore from foy uh and they they've been really supportive for us you know been very flexible giving us good price and and They've been really supportive of what we're doing. and, and They want to help facilitate, basically, yeah, the journey. They've given our, our product onto their contacts and um, things have really, you know, they've really helped us out. Anyway, their mussels are beautiful. Uh, we harvested them in uh, winter, so like December, January is a really good time to harvest their mussels. And we paired them with a cider marinade. Um, we used a cider from Borough Hill. It's a beautiful cider farm in Somerset. They're close family friends of mine, my mum and dad's, and they also run the cider bus at Glastonbury. Um, so they are... It's great cider. They are legends, <laughs> um, and their cider's beautiful. So we use their cider vinegar and their, and their um, medium cider to make the marinade. And what else? We've got the mussels with Endia. We use uh, this incredible Endia from Dorset, this guy called uh, Matt. He's from The Real Cure. This company's called The Real Cure. And he makes this traditional India uh, with chilies from Calabria, like the most legit India you'll ever eat. It's still got, you know, seeds in there and you can see like the, the chili. He only uses fresh chili, doesn't use any powders and it is banging. The flavor is insane. And uh, I love using it in, in our cans. Some people question the use of India with, with sort of mussels and seafood, but that's to me is something I'm, I'm used to. I haven't worked in Trullo and like in, in restaurants like you would treat so with cod or something. It's a similar kind of aesthetic, sim um, similar taste. We wanted to do something different. There are people now pushing boundaries in canned fish. There's guys in Spain that are doing some amazing stuff like grilling their fish, using like different marinades and vinegars. Uh, but we just had complete freedom to do what we wanted. So we were like, let's just do something totally different. We put India in the mussels and people love it. Pollock is a fish that we wanted to use because it's a really good alternative to cod. We anticipated doing a bacalao style can. Cod in the south coast is definitely not an option. It's been overfished for years. Um, you can get really good cod from Scotland, but Pollock is a fantastic alternative. It's a really flaky, white, uh, beautiful fish. And so we wanted to preserve something similar to cod. I keep going over this so. <laughs> over and over. We've got a can that's a real winner. People come back to the market every week and buy. It's salt pollock with garlic, bay and olive oil. So I make a really fragrant garlic uh, and bay infused oil. So it's marinating big flakes of, of salted pollock. So we wanted to create a bacalao kind of style di uh, can. White fish doesn't really hold up very well in a can of fish. And, and throughout the canning procedure. So we, um, yeah, we, we wanted to give it a bit more texture and it holds up really well. So that is a, that's a real winner, that one. You get a nice umami kind of kick from the, the salt and then the fragrant garlic oil people love. They can just throw it into their, their salads or on toast with eggs, whatever. Do you take any inspiration from around the world, like with the Induya, or are you trying to really set a bit of a stamp of like your kind of culinary experience or story behind, behind what you're doing? Um, our, our, our aim was to do, yeah, to do cans with big flavour and have real kind of, each can has got their own distinct narrative and like reason behind it. Sort of separating ourselves from, from other brands, I suppose, was quite important. I definitely look towards... Uh, what the existing canneries are doing with their fish and constantly testing and trialing and eating theirs and seeing what I can take from what they're doing. You know? I also, yeah, it was important for us to put our own stamp on it. We are the first and only people canning fish in England. So it was important to get off to a flyer and, and do something different and catch people's attention. Um, it's an amazing guy I recommend everyone follows on Instagram called da uh, Rainbow Tomatoes. Uh, an amazing guy called Dan, who's been so supportive from the start. He's a tin fish fanatic, and he's got the biggest collection 
for sale of tin fish in the world. Every brand going. Um, and he also grows an insane amount of varieties of tomatoes. He's got a massive following and he's a real tin fish enthusiast. Um, and he congratulated us on what we were doing from the start and said, it's great that you're doing something different. Um, I will say a big influence uh, was a brand in Spain called Hayumar. They are insane. Like their cans can sell for like 55 quid and it will be like the belly of a tuna that's been slowly grilled over um, wood and then it's canned. And it will just be like a culinary masterpiece. Masterpiece, honestly. <laughs> and he, you know, he has like whole ten like octopus tentacles that have been obviously like tenderized and then grilled over over open coals. Wow. And they'll be in a can. All of his sardines are grilled. So that to me is just like I love grilled food. I've worked in Trulo that has a charcoal grill. I'm just like the possibilities are endless. Yeah. And it's just so inspiring because. No one's done that yet. Everyone's been following kind of traditional methods and means, and he's just suddenly gone, nah. Yeah. We've got some stuff in the pipeline that's really exciting. We were um, talking to uh, Sertash from Mangal 2. We're going to do some stuff together. Uh, he's got some amazing ideas. And yeah, something something to come, which is, I can't wait to talk a bit more about. That's really exciting. Yeah. It's a great restaurant. Yeah, it's a fantastic restaurant. <laughs> yeah. And he's just such a legend, and he's really open to to anything and yeah he, he's up for it so we are yeah we're in talks with them and my grilled fish in a can dream is going to come to life yeah <laughs> mate i can't wait yeah can't wait have you um seen the fish butchery out in um australia yeah, Josh Nyland, yeah some of that stuff obviously very like not cannering but yeah. i think he's really pushing the boundaries when it comes to fish and stuff like that it's yeah, really yeah. exciting to see yeah, those models and stuff like that i think i look at his instagram on a saturday he's opened a little place in paddington that's just doing grilled yeah, fish yeah. and chips and i'm just like absolutely like yeah. bit of the north star and just like really changing the conversation yeah, yeah. with fish and like doing like that like nose to tail kind of stuff yeah. within fish which exactly, is amazing yeah. and it and it's a conversation that everyone needs to be having you know yeah, yeah he's uh um, he's really set the bar and, and uh people from all over the world are looking to him and thinking this guy is hot shit <laughs> and i guess really like leading on from there obviously you are so young in your journey and things like that but it's very clear to hear in your voice there's a lot of ambition and like yeah there must be a bit of a North Star and things like that. So is is that like being able to use charcoals and being yeah. able to do that? Or is there, what, 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 what for you at this moment in time would be like the next, the next few years and steps for you? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've always been quite reserved with my ambition. Um, and You're a very got... humble human, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually being with Charlotte, Charlotte is the driving force of this. You know, you're talking to me, but she is the, she's the uh, engine. She's constantly pushing me, and I would never have done this without her. So she has kick-started something in me, you know, she's sort of ignited something. Um, and now I just envisage a cannery with a room where we can grill all of our fish. You know, around the corner, there's a smoker. We can smoke our fish. The possibilities are endless. We, you know, we're looking at units now to expand, and uh, we're dreaming big because I can suddenly do that. <laughs> I think, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I, I feel inspired by what we're doing. And um, I do feel like we'll create a legacy and I, I'm confident that we're going to bring out a whole range of tin fish that have, has never been seen before. So really exciting. Yeah. Really, really exciting. Also as well, during the conversation, you referred to America a couple of times. Is it that they're like catastrophists and they're worried about the world blowing up so they can loads of stuff? Is that the vibe? Yeah, and they just love, the, I guess, like such a big country. And yeah. when you've got like, places like middle america where they're all growing their own veg quite rural areas i suppose yeah. that's where they do it generally okay but yeah they are terrified of it at the same time they put the fear into me but also talking to professionals surrounding yourself with people that know what they're talking about is mm. key like yeah. you can gain knowledge from people that know what they're doing and, and we got confidence from yeah from all those, yeah from yeah professionals that, and also as well, I'm sure you have to send samples off for testing, yeah, for bacterial exactly, yeah. and things like that. Like yeah. it's a very rigorous kind of process yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, you know, we've been doing that from day one. And from these guys, we've learned what the procedures are. And even though we are a young company, we feel like we're doing everything that a big cannery would be doing. 
and safety is number one. Yeah. We can be as adventurous and silly on Instagram as we want and, and come up with all these random recipes, but safety is number one. And we're, we're very focused on creating a, a, a tasty but 100% safe product. Being the only cannery based in England at this moment in time, I'm sure you've attracted a lot of attention. Um, yeah. What's, what have been the conversations? Who, who wants to know what's going on and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I mean, every day, every weekend on the market, um, we've got a little sign that says, England's only fish cannery in lovely colourful crayons from my daughter's cupboards. Uh, <laughs> and people are just sort of reading it and staring at it thinking, really? Wow. And it sparks a conversation. It just attracts yeah, a lot of attention and, and people want to know all about it and why and, you know, you sure, or like, you know, all these questions are, are asked. But yeah, we are the only people doing it and uh, uh, featured in The Guardian a couple of weeks after we launched, which was crazy. We had, um, alongside Jose Pizarro and Mitch Thompson, who are two, like, big, you know, big players. Yeah. And to be featured alongside them and give my recommendations on how to eat tin fish two weeks after we launched was quite mad so uh that track yeah that was the first bit of attention and lulu grimes who um is the editor of the olive bbc food magazine she bought on the first day of our market at victoria park and has bought every every week since and she's been a really big support and she's put us in recently into the may edition uh, did a little piece about sustainability and just generally lots of messages of support people being really interested in what we're doing, shops that want to stock us. The product has kind of sold itself, which is very helpful. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess the story and, and us being the only people doing it, 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 sort of that sells it. And also I hope that the product itself backs that up. And it's a very colorful, vibrant brand that we wanted to you know, portray as family orientated. And yeah. That, that gets a lot of positive feedback as well. Really nice. Really, really nice. And I guess for you at this moment in time, are there any, what are the biggest things in which you are looking forward to like attack and overcome if there are any at this moment for you? Upscaling, make products that are viable. We need products that are going to make money, but also we want to make products that are ethically you know, sourced and you only use quality ingredients that cost money. And to be all of those things and have a successful business is hard work trying to you know work the margins in your favor so they're hurdles that we're, we're kind of tackling quite a numb painful thigh and i think it's basically come from standing for 16 hours prepping fish on my own and i'm very eager just to like get hold of all this fish that's going to be coming <laughs> it's not a hurdle but i'm just like quite impatient i you know i'm waiting for these sardines and all the mackerel to come in so i can to into season so I, so I can crack on and, and do these cans i want great just grow the you know grow the range i love that um seasons on my hurdle no joke yeah no 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 <laughs> but i think this is the thing as well people need to realize that we need to be able to and eat with the seasons and like it's very important if yeah. that is the conversation that everyone wants to be part of and believe in and yeah. uh, actually facilitate then you have to be able to like slow down a little yeah, bit yeah, unfortunately exactly, yeah. and I think for me you know on this journey as well this is the biggest conversation which needs to be had like if you actually want all of these things you need to there needs to be people that are willing to you know spend firstly yeah. But there also needs to be people like yourself that are actually breaking down these barriers to actually be able to take this to a larger scale and taking it to a larger scale will mean that it is more accessible but at this moment in time because actually for true or the idea of sustainability and also ethics within it unfortunately it does cost and i think that's yeah. that's the thing that people really need to start understanding yeah. that like if that's well if that's who you want to be then you actually have to put your money where your mouth is yeah. unfortunately at this moment yeah absolutely and um we've got the trip yeah the, the, the job of convincing people that can fish can be a premium product um there are brands from europe that are doing that now uh like jose gourmet and, and a few other ones um, and they're getting seen in, in a lot of shops around uh all over the place all over the world but you know we're in london a lot of shops in london stocking these guys and 
thankfully their prices are not too dissimilar to ours and it, and they've kind of broken down a bit of a barrier for us. Right. So people are becoming more aware of quality, well-sourced tin fish. So we've basically, you know, we've landed on this product at the right time because there's been, there's been that kind of barrier that's been broken for us. So great. So uh, a theme in which I've been running, I've, I've a bit of your biscuit, mate. Oh, I, can, I can tell you haven't eaten. Bless you. <laughs> you haven't tucked into your egg sandwich, and you're on the picky. No. Bless you. Um, so yeah, part of part of the theme really when I've been having conversations with people is like, where's their favourite like hidden gem restaurant mm. or little small eats place or dig? Mm. And then also it's like if there was anyone that you could go there with to maybe drive some inspiration or have a conversation to be able to get some life hacks within this, within other parts of your life, who do you think that person would be? Ooh, um, so many. <laughs> uh, Towpath Cafe. Okay, not heard of Towpath Cafe. Definitely should go, brother. Okay. It's fantastic. It's on the Regent's Canal. It's a shutter that opens up. It's got a little kitchen, and then next to it is another shutter that opens up. It's got a bit of a, it's a bar and a bit of a seating area, and they just they just bang out delicious food. Chalkboard written every every day. They've got a breakfast option, and then it moves on to lunch. Um, and they're just doing, you know, all the right stuff using seasonal produce, whether it's locally made. Full on, yeah, flavour focused, delicious food. Love it. Slightly Rochelle canteen vibe, kind of okay. it's like kind of yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Which yeah. is also another favourite. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> if you're gonna like, you don't want to give that secret away to too many people, but that is a real secret yeah. in Gem, Rochelle it canteen. It's, it's just a touch. Yeah. It's just so good. You walk through that door for the first time in the middle of summer, and you're like, what? <laughs> this exists. It's just insane. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice place to work. Fond nice. memories of like podding, podding beans and peas, and for an event, I was just sat on a bench for like four hours in the sun, just like podding, <laughs> just surrounded by beautiful flowers. It's like it's not a bad place. Not to work. a bad way to live your life <laughs> yeah. in any way, shape, or form. Good bit of mise en place. Yeah. Um, and anyone that comes to mind that you think you'd like to go to, maybe uh, Prince. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love that. Can we bring him back from the dead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I remember being at a bar when Prince is uh, on, not the day Prince died, but uh, on the anniversary. And obviously, the bar owner was just like, just love Prince. It was like Prince vinyl all night, and like on the hour, every hour, like we were just doing shots and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. I was like, I think his memory will live on forever and ever oh, and ever. Man. I saw him twice. Um, in Camden at the Electric Palace when yeah. he did two he did two secret shows. Yeah. I was pulling pints when I first moved to London. I walked back to my flat and I just popped into my housemate's uh, room, said hello, and he was just like in bed on Twitter on his phone. He's like, apparently Prince is playing in town. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, like my mates are sex me saying Prince is playing. I'm like, fucking get out of bed, mate. Is he going? Tuesday night, he's like, oh. What? I'm like, yeah, we're fucking going. So we ran to the bus stop to go and to like get the bus. To, we didn't have a car, didn't have any form of transport. Ran to the bus stop, pissed in the rain, grabbed a couple of cans. Half 12 on a Tuesday night. Buses until like 15 minutes. Takes 45 minutes to get there. It's going to be an hour. It's going to be gone one by the time we get there. He's like, mate, I'm going to go to bed. I was like, there's no fucking way you're going to bed. You come with me. We're going to go and see Prince. If he's in town, we've got to see him. As we were waiting at the bus stop, the car pulls up and it's our Turkish hairdresser. And he... Um, He's got a bit of a rep locally. Uh, and he, he was always talking about all the different cars he can get his hands on. And like his uncle, I don't know, a bit dodgy. But he pulls up in a brand new Merc and says, where are you going, boys? And we're like, oh, we're actually going to go to Camden to see Prince. He's like, who? <laughs> I was like, well, we're going to go to Camden. And he's like, yeah, get in. <laughs> we're literally there in 10 minutes. Oh, mate. into Camden. <laughs> so it was so good. And then he just pulled up outside the electric palace. We legged it. And there was a fucking massive queue of people. We were like, oh my God, it's actually happening. And then um, our mates, James and Danny, big up, were at the front of the queue. They were like, Joe, Angus. And we went over and like hugging them, all the way excited. And then this guy just shouted, no phones, no cameras. And, and we ran. We were like, skipped the whole queue. Mate. Ran into the building. It was like smoke, smoky kind of like uh, dance floor. And then on the stage was Prince, this fro, playing guitar. If you like press and people fake taking photos, and we were there at the front of this gig with like a hundred people. It was the nuts this night of my life. And then um, 
they announced that there was another super kick the night after, so it went, <sighs> went again. Yeah. And then queued for a long, like, queued yeah. for the whole day for that one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was fucking crazy. And Amazing. I would never forget it. <laughs> and so I wanted to bring him back to <laughs> Towpath yeah. to tell him how sick it was. Yeah. <laughs> and give him some, like, yeah. confit garlic on Goat's Go Toast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I imagine him just you going there with your headphones in, just like reminiscing and yeah, going yeah, through that man. time. That was amazing. Mate, absolutely amazing. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for sharing Mate. the time because I know how busy you are and everything like yeah, that, yeah. and I really appreciate it. Yes. Um, we were, so, yeah. We're doing smoked trout today. Perfect. Yeah, I can't wait to try some. Yeah, man. See Perfect. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Really appreciate nice that. Nice one. I don't know if I want to eat this.